Today, we live in a world of radically expanding horizons, and yet, at the same time with those expanding horizons, the world is radically contracting. So we, we, we have to live with this paradox of expansion and contraction, and we haven't found the pathway to something <coughs> that is more workable and more universally just. Now, um, uh, I want to divide my introduction into two parts. One is simply the modern version, and then I'll go back into the, the longer version of the complex idea of the rule of law and democracy. Uh, the shorter version is essentially this. Um, in the early 1900s, the Supreme Court decided a, a very, very powerful decision called Lochner. And in Lochner, what the Supreme Court did was it stated that property rights are essentially natural law rights and could not be regulated by the state. And by property, they included the right to contract, so that New York couldn't regulate the hours and wages of New York bakery workers because that interfered with the contract rights of the manufacturers. Uh, and that decision essentially became a cornerstone for unlimited uh, use of capital without restraint and without government regulation. And that was one of the reasons that led to the Great Depression. So the great challenge that Roosevelt had was he had to change the Constitution in some way. And uh, we forget how many legislative efforts on the part of the Roosevelt administration were struck down by the Supreme Court and on the basis of the Lochner decision. Eventually, the only way to get out of the Depression was to get rid of the Supreme Court. So Roosevelt said, let's get some legislation and pack the court with people who are sane. That almost created another revolution, but it didn't get that far because God intervened, you see. Uh, about four of these guys fortuitously died and he was able to appoint the guys more sympathetic to his uh, views about the New Deal. Well, the New Deal was really in many ways a, the, the formulation or rationalization um, of something that some people have called the social democratic constitution. It was a much better uh, formulated uh, position between labor, capital, and government. In other words, nothing was frozen, but interests had to be obviously articulated publicly, and the government had a rational role in mediating between capital and labor. Now, uh, the, this was not a complete revolution in terms of the New Deal. The New Deal was still incomplete. But World War II changed the posture of, of the private sector. The private sector now became a full-fledged partner in the economy and benefited many, mightily from it because they manufactured the war materials. And <clears throat> as a consequence, uh, the foundations of the social democratic constitution became much more firmly established. In 1941, Churchill, who was no Democrat, and, uh, and uh, Roosevelt uh, brought to the Congress of the United States the Atlantic Charter. Now, the Atlantic Charter is famous for its four freedoms. Freedom of speech and expression, freedom of conscience and belief, freedom from want, and freedom from fear. So, economic rights, peace, and political rights. Uh, there were no dissenters. Uh, and in fact, I remember some servicemen being interviewed in 1994, anniversary of D-Day, and they were explaining why their pals were killed there and there and then. And the interviewer was a Dutch interviewer. And, 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 and why were you guys doing this? Uniformly, they said, we were doing this for the four freedoms. Okay. Now, uh, <clears throat> the, the, uh, the four freedoms then represented the democratic compact. And uh, what it did was it, it also generated one of the great social revolutions of the planet, namely, it created the largest middle class in the world. That had never been happened anywhere else. So that was a, 
a major, if you like, transformation in the United States based on the social democratic constitution. But Lochner wasn't dead, it had been modified, so uh, neo-economic policy came in and uh, jacked up Lochner using Stalinism as the dummy because Stalin, as you know, was a great expropriator of property and a denier of the idea that individuals had the right to own any property. Uh, and so, as a consequence, uh, the position of neoliberal <coughs> economy was to, again, assert the idea that the right to property is sacrosanct and really should be immune from government regulation. So, so, that's, so we've gone through that, and the consequence of neo liberalism on the American middle class is that it's rather frozen it. And the lower segment of the American middle class feels threatened because they, uh, there's nothing in the system that benefits them. Now, uh, I only mention this to say because the other consequence of the four freedoms uh, was that it was the foundation of the United Nations Charter. And then you have to ask yourself, well, what is the status of the UN Charter? Is it really a global constitution, or is it just a piece of paper that you wag now and then, and then go to sleep? Uh, the the uh, at the anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, at least ten European uh, leaders made it absolutely clear that the UN Charter was our global constitution. Although I don't think any of you have thought about it as a a constitution. It's not a constitution like a, a nation state. It, it, it functions in terms of the power relations on a horizontal and not a vertical basis. I mean, it, there's reciprocity. I subscribe to this because if I don't, and you don't subscribe to it, we, we both lose, you know? And so the, the challenge then is still an important challenge of understanding the status of uh, the United Nations Charter as a global constitution in which states are subject to the rules uh, of the international system. And to supplement that, we have an International Bill of Rights, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Civil and Political Rights, Cultural, Social, and Other Rights, and, and many, many more things. But, but what this add up to is one of the most mature expressions of the idea of the social democratic compact. Um, and they have influenced constitution making around the world, but often these constitutions end up as bits of paper rather than operation living practices to be utilized on a daily basis. So I would say that we have a threat, if you like, to the rule of law by the diminishing of our democratic social constitution <laughs> from a global point of view and to a large extent also nationally. Some states like China believe that their sovereignty cannot be compromised by international commitments, unless they specifically consent to it, and they very rarely do so. So, so. so our challenge is the social democratic constitution, whether it's national or, or global. Now, just to get back to the notion of the law and democracy, I did a quick and dirty summary, which goes something like this. I went back to Hammurabi, we had the first code first written code. Now, the, the real point of it was that it wasn't a democracy, but what Hamri Rabi's code did was it made clear that the subjects of his empire had certain rights that they could articulate. They, in other words, they had space for, for certain activities important to themselves. Even, even if not justified by democracy, the code provided the space upon which they could act in the society. And that is a form, if you like, of freedom that can be augmented. Now, some centuries later, the Romans emerged with something called the Law of the Twelve Tables. We don't know exactly what was in it because it doesn't survive. But we know the background, namely, that it was a conflict between the plebeians and the patricians. Is it almost that? You've got to give me five minutes, okay? <coughs> I've got five more minutes to summarize this. Okay. Uh, and, 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 of course, the way they solved problems in those days, the priest cut open a chicken 
and how the entrails fell determined who won the case, and usually the patricians won. So the law of the Twelve Tables changed that and gave the plebs some space to claim their basic rights under law, you see. That evolved into the Roman jurors creating a whole jurisprudence of rights and stuff, and uh, Alpin, who was one of the great ones, took this and actually integrated Stoic philosophy into it. So uh, many people say Alpin is the father of, of modern human rights. Uh, then it was Theodora. Uh, Justinian was a donkey and she was the brain. And she got Justinian to codify the entire civil law, uh, the institutes, the digest, the codex, and the novellae. These survived and became the cornerstone of European education around about the 10th century, you see. But all the laws were written down. There followed a tradition of great uh, European scholarship writing up these things uh, so that the average citizen could know what their rights and duties were. And this culminated in Napoleon codifying the whole thing and virtually making it accessible almost universally. Uh, so, so that everyone, even with the imperfections of democracy, they could claim their rights under law. You see. England had a slightly different version of this, the Magna Carta, forced King John to concede certain rights to nobility. Those were expanded to the rest of the population and the evolution of parliamentary institutions still further limited the role of the autocrat. And eventually we got a tremendous uh, democratic tradition out of the evolution of English law via the Magna Carta. Uh, and all of these things take us to the point where we get to World War II, where now some, all of these are coming together in the form of a a, a compact, a global compact, a, a social democratic compact with a Bill of Rights. There's a great deal to learn about this International Bill of Rights and a great deal that still has to be implemented. But we can't say we don't have any ideas where we're going. And the Bill of Rights is one of the most important ideas for the affirmation of the idea of the democratic right of it. And what the, the law had done is it created spaces all along the way for these rights to be expanded to where there's a fully fledged articulate ideology that the, the idea of democratic participation in the important political decisions that affect a person are human rights. And as such, they require special protection, including protections from the rule of law. Thank you. <laughs>